So once again, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sean Conrad. I'm a transportation planner with the uh, Community Schools and Transportation Program in the Sustainable Development Team at the North Central Texas Council of Governments. And then with me today is Erin Curry, uh, also a transportation planner in the Community Schools and Transportation Program. Um, we saw the need for this offering due to the growth and development patterns in the region um, and the need to better enable safe walking and bicycling to school for school age children that's safe and comfortable and convenient so they have a viable option to get to school using uh, what we call active transportation. Um, we have some excellent speakers lined up and we hope you find it valuable and <coughs> for some discussion. So just to give you a heads up, this is number one in the series. Uh, we've got two more webinars that we're planning for later this year. Uh, webinar number two is planned for the summer. That will focus on fiscally sustainable development and its connection to active transportation and safe routes to school. And then our third webinar we're planning for the fall. So that will be focused on coordination among cities, ISDs, developers to plan for right size and right location of new schools uh, in the hopes that we can continue to enable safe and comfortable active transportation options for school aged children getting to school. So keep an eye out for those webinars and we hope you'll join us. Uh, here's just an overview of today's uh, webinar. Aaron and I will provide a brief, brief introduction to the webinar and the topic. Uh, so you'll hear from Aaron in just a minute. Dr. Norman Garrick with the University of Connecticut will provide us with the academic research uh, perspective with this discussion of street networks and sustainable places. And then we'll have two local examples highlighting innovative street connectivity and subdivision sub 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 design measures that have been in use in our region. So we have Mary Elliott from the city of Fort Worth and Jennifer Pru with the city of Waxahachie are joining us for that discussion. Um, we ask that you participate in a really brief uh, poll here to help us understand our audience. Um, you can use the QR code to access that poll, or you can uh, go to the website here and enter the code to access that. And we'll also put that in the chat as well so that you can access the there. So we'll give that a second. Then Aaron is going to show you the results. All right, it looks like we've got a good number of responses coming in. So I'll go ahead and show you all results. So it looks like we got a lot of planners and engineers on the call, which makes a lot of sense. A um, couple consultants, private citizen, and a few other mysterious folks, they picked the other. Uh, if you wanna share um, what you would consider yourself, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, very cool. Give that another minute and then we'll go to the second question. All right. Next question. Have you or your organization ever worked on any street network connectivity projects? Just looking to gauge um, who's here. There's none. Oh, wow. Lots of y'all. Very cool. Awesome. Got a bunch of experts. And I hope you all that pick no learn something cool today. Great. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Let me get back here.
Okay, um, Aaron, are you seeing our presentation? I am, so we're good to go. All right, I'll just have a little trouble there. All right, so we are going to be done. I'm going to hand it over to Aaron now. She's going to provide a brief introduction to the topic and its importance and um, how it's important to stay across the school. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Good way, Aaron. All right. Yeah, so I'm just going to give a brief introduction on our topic, kind of draw the line between St. Francis School and street connectivity. Yeah. Uh, I'm still seeing the Mentimeter slide, Sean. OK, I think that's the problem. <laughs> Here we go. OK, so just very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about why St. Francis School is important. Uh, we've seen a big reduction in students that walk and bike to school in favor of being driven in the past 50 years. Now so that K to 12 school trips now account for about 10 to 14 percent of traffic during the morning commute times. Um, safer to school pro programs offer easier and safer routes for students to be able to walk and bike. We know that students are healthier and have better school performance from this increased exercise when they are able to actively commute to school. We also can save a lot of money for our schools and for our households with reduced need for busing and reduced need to drive kids to school. Um, so to set the stage in our region, um, back in 2017, we had our last iteration of the National Household Transportation Survey that found in our region that only 10% of school students are actually walking or biking. Um, so we can look at that and think about pre-COVID rates of transportation. Obviously, right now there's a lot of virtual learning going on, but we anticipate that we'll get back to full, full in-person and be looking at similar numbers again in the future. We also know there's a lot of development going on in the region. There's quite a bit of new subdivisions coming in, quite a bit of new lots, and a large um, population growth expected. Um, for 2045, we're looking at over three and a half million people coming into the region. So talking about traditional subdivision street networks, um, often they're not built to accommodate safe and convenient active transportation due to things like cul-de-sacs, long block lengths, which could encourage um, high speeds for cars and mid-block crossings, looking at limited points of entry and exit, which make it hard to find direct routes, especially if you're walking or biking and low connectivity between neighboring subdivisions. So street connectivity is important because it can promote active transportation. We have greater levels of connectivity. We're looking at improved route choices for our destinations, more direct routes and a wider dispersal of vehicle traffic. You can see in these two images, um, the houses and the schools are a similar distance apart, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but because of the street network, um, one route to the school is a lot shorter than the other. So in the state of Texas, subdivision design approval is a function of our local governments and subdivision plans must be approved if they conform to the municipality's plan for curing future streets. If a municipality would try to reject a proposal because they didn't like the design, but it checked all the boxes, <clears throat> they would be they could be subject to legal challenges. So the best time to ensure connectivity and promote our active transportation is before the design phase even starts. Um, we're looking at things like actually writing into our subdivision design codes, things that support active transportation and coordinating with our developers very early on in the process. Um, so a few strategies that we'll touch on today later on are things like connectivity indexes, which measure how well connected internally the new road network will be using a ratio of segments and nodes, and then some other things like shorter block lanes, eliminating cul-de-sacs and requiring connections between our subdivisions. So putting this all together with um, Safe Routes to School, well-connected street networks support safe routes to school and let our kids walk and bike from the beginning of a subdivision so you don't have to go back later and retrofit, which can be very expensive. Um, walking and biking routes from subdivisions to schools aren't easy to do. They're not safe, they're not comfortable, they're not direct, they won't be used because humans expend energy to reach our destination. So we're going to look for the things that offer the path of least resistance. If it's not easy, we won't do it. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the importance of school and ISD coordination with our cities. Um, our cities and our ISDs make decisions that affect each other in transportation. We're looking um, to promote this because these can, these this excuse me this coordination can be mutually beneficial to both groups. Often when they're completing the same kinds of localized analysis on things like population growth and transportation independently of one another when they could be collaborating. So we know that funding is limited and smart land use planning can affect transportation choices. Um, so since we got y'all, I'm going to talk a little bit about our resources that we have on our website. Um, we reach, reach, we recently um, published our school district public transportation coordination in the Dallas Fort Worth region report. We have some safe routes to school resources on our website, our Lookout Texans program, which has school curriculum, school zone safety tips, and some examples of some safe routes to school plans we've done within our region. We also have our planning for community oriented schools guide, um, a tool that we love in sustainable development, the EPA smart school siting tool. Um, coming soon to our website is some joint use agreement resources and some memos about coordination between different government entities. So I'll talk a little bit more about our joint use agreement. If you're not sure what those are, um, they're formal agreements usually between two separate government entities, such as a school and a city to share public property and facilities. So coming to our website are some local examples from within our region. Um, we also are going to be sharing some joint use agreement resources from a legal nonprofit called Change Lab that we are really into. Um, and we'll be also giving out some guidance on new joint use agreements. That'll be on the school siting page on our website. Um, so here's our information if you'd like any more information on the things I just presented. Uh, so that's it. Thanks, John. Thank you, Aaron. All right, I think we'll continue on to our first uh, presentation uh, guest speaker. Um, that will be Dr. Norman Garrick. So Dr. Garrick is a professor emeritus in the Department of Civil Engineering and co-director of the Sustainable Cities Research Group at the University of Connecticut. In these roles, he has led research related to street networks and safety and the design and operation of streets particularly related to bicycle and pedestrian safety. So we're really excited to have Dr. Garrick today. Dr. Garrick. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be part of this effort. I think this is a really important effort, especially in a place like Texas, where there is so much growth going on right now, and we need to get some of that growth right in the right places. Um, I hope nobody is offended by my choice of um, a picture from Austin, but that's the urban area in the state that I knew know the best. So I thought I would use some examples from Austin to ground this presentation uh, before I get into some of the theory. So if we move on to the next slide. Okay. All right. So um, this is the uh, Austin metropolitan area. Ne uh, next few slides, please. Uh, what I want to look at. Uh, yes, thank you. And and the third one and the fourth. Yeah. So what I want to look at are four. If you could go back one. Are four different areas in the Austin metropolitan area, starting in the center and working out from there, one, two, three, four, to the very edge. So what we have downtown, um, number one, next slide please, is basically what you have in Dallas or Fort Worth, um, a very traditional American connected street system. And one of the things I want to really emphasize here is that when people talk about street con connectivity, sometimes people confuse the idea of a gridiron like we have in a lot of American cities to, and, and they conflate that idea with the idea of connectedness. 
being connected is not necessarily the same as, as having a gridiron system. So we're not talking about building gridirons necessarily like we have in the center of a lot of American cities that were built out by the railroads. So this is the downtown built probably somewhere in the 1800s. Um, and it's connected downtown internally. It's connected to the surrounding neighborhoods. The buildings are relate to the street. Uh, all of these things are examples of early 1900s, late 1800s American urbanism. And it worked really well for a long time. In some places, including in Texas, it has been degraded over time by street widening, by taking space for parking, et cetera. But the, the basic bones of the city, the, the connected streets are still there. Next slide, please. So this is another um, part of the metropolitan area. And when I was looking to, for examples, this immediately caught my eye. And then I remember that this is a place I had been when it was just being built. This is Mueller which is on the old, the grounds of the old Mueller Airport in Austin. And what it does, it emulates a lot of the features, but not all, of downtown. So we are in some ways going back to an older pattern of development um, represented by what we see here at Mueller, or, or Miller, <laughs> I should say. Um, let's go on to the next slide. This represents more 1940s, 1950s urbanism, where we're seeing the connectivity is breaking down. So we have these pods or um, segments of development that are not connected to each other. And this is where we start to have problems with people walking or biking to get around, or even with transit properly supporting these, these places. The next slide, please. And this is where connectivity on the edges, 1970s, 1980s example of buildings where the connectivity has totally broken down. I will get back to these um, images later, but let me go into some of the theory. So next slide. So um, one of the things I wanted to talk about um, Streets, you cannot talk about street network without thinking about streets. And we have come a long way over the last 20 years in terms of developing manuals that help us design streets better. One of the first ones which I was happy to have worked on was from 2007, the ITE CNU um, FAWA sponsored and also the smart growth from the EPA, the smart growth um, group from the EPA all sponsored this um, document that really led to a revolution in how we, we think about streets. After that, next slide, and just keep rolling through it. Next one, next one. After that, we saw um, different cities coming up with their own manuals because there was really nothing at the, um, the national level except for the ITE document. So each of these cities had to come up with their own manual. Next slide, please. Um, but now, NACTO, I think, is really set the stage and has really, really taken the ball and run with it, I would say, and have created a street design manual that anybody around the world can um, really adopt and use to address a lot of the issues that we need to address with street design. Although I should say that one thing that they have not really done, none of these manuals have done very well, is address the issue of street network connectivity in any detailed way. So some of what I'm presenting is unfortunately not in any of these manuals. So next slide. So one of the things that NACTO and these earlier manuals that I talked about have done is 
ask us to change how we think about streets. So in the past, and still in many places, we're thinking about streets as primarily for motor vehicles. So motor vehicles on the top, private motor vehicles, and walking, biking at the bottom. What NACTO is asking us to do, next slide please, is to reverse that um, and point out that there are numerous benefits in many ways, economic, social, environmental benefit from reversing this pyramid and putting people at the top. And this is what these guys are about. And this is what also understanding the importance of street connectivity is about. Next slide. Um, and one of the big reasons why this is so important is just due to sheer space. In, in urban areas, in suburban areas, space is at a premium. And so you don't want to devote so much space to moving people. Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Okay, so what I've come up with, um, well, I came up with this years ago, and I think it's a really important perspective to go forward that there are three essential elements of urban street design. The first is, please, the next slide. A con you need connected and complete street networks. So you don't have good suburban or urban streets if they're not connected, if they're not part of a complete network. And an important part of that issue is that you need different types of streets serving different functions. So you need busy streets, you need quieter streets, and you need streets that are more commercial and streets that are more residential. What we're talking about here is building places that serve the full range of human needs, not as we have been doing in the past, creating these monoculture places. And this is also part of the story. Next slide. We also need to be concerned with the convenience and comfort of this and safety of all road users. But in this point, I would emphasize that we need to be particularly concerned about non-motorized road users because they are not shielded by metal and plastic and glass. And the third um, point is that, that roads convey to us a sense of place. Is it a place that we want to be in? Is it a place that we're comfortable in? And if we treat streets as places for just movement, then we end up with the type of streets that we see all over the United States. So we need to consider streets as places, not just conduits for travel. They need to set the tone for what a place feels and function. Thank you. So the next one. So, um, what is interesting to me about this subject is that the United States has an exquisite um, um, a history of building connected street networks. And this goes back to the 1600s in places like Savannah, Georgia, um, Charleston, South Carolina, um, of course, Washington DC in the 18 in the in the 1700s, etc. Coming back to the railroad towns that were built all uh, over the South and Midwest and the West of the United States. So we know we had the knowledge of how to do this. We have lost that knowledge to some extent, and I'm glad to see it coming back. Um, with discussions like this and with the introduction, which shows some of the important elements of this. So next slide, please. Um, one of the question is, what happened to that knowledge? And there are lots of influences that led to this. One of them was, of course, Le Corbusier, um, a Swiss French architect who decided that streets were obsolete and we needed to get rid of them. And his idea was these towers in the park, which we know in most places now are really towers in parking lots. Um, next slide. 
America was also influenced by the Garden City movement from the UK, and that was brought to America in the late 1920s with this town of Radburn in New Jersey. That should be New, New Jersey, not New York. Um, next slide. So this led to a radical, uh, well, an evolution, really. It's, it wasn't as radical as I'm making it out. It was, it was radical evolution, but it was still an evolution. And this is illustrated by this, um, this figure that is I attribute to a colleague, um, Stephen Marshall from UCL in London. So you can see the red line represents around 1950s where most places that were built before that looks like the the um the image just to to the um left of the red line and most places built after that we start to see an evolution the 1950s till the 1970s where things just totally broke apart next slide please so how did this occur it didn't occur by accident in our research, what we found was it was a federal agency that led to these changes. And weirdly, it was not an agency that was in planning or transportation, but it was a federal housing authority. Um, and it looks like now we're going to also have federal lead to change some of this coming perhaps from the DOT. Um, in the late 30s, the FHA issued PAMP pamphlets like this saying that a certain types of patterns were bad. Next slide. Next um, click. And some were good. Next click. Um, and so, um, and they were able to get this changed, embedded in American culture because they really controlled the, um, the purse string and they would tell people that you could not build along the lines of the old style way of building in America. So this came about in the 30s. The war happened. A lot didn't happen. A lot didn't get built. But after the war, this was ready to go. Next slide, please. So one of the things that they, one of the justifications that they gave for doing this was they said that the old style patterns were dangerous. And when we looked into the literature, we found no evidence of any work being done to compare different street patterns on the basis of safety. So around nine, 2007, we decided to actually take up the challenge of the FH, the Federal Housing Authority, and actually research this question. And we did it by looking at 24 cities in California the reason for California was that there were so many cities and such a wide range of different types of cities that it was a good test bed for our ideas. Next slide. So one of the things we find, this is very quick, um, a, um, quick summary, is that when you compare the patterns on the left to the patterns on the right, next slide, we found that the chance of being severely injured was 30% higher in those newer patterns. The chance of being killed was actually 50% higher in those um, newer patterns. So the idea that this was about safety just doesn't hold any water. Next slide, please. And we also found, just keep going. We also found that when you compared um, okay, when you compared the pattern on the bottom to the pattern on the top, the rates of walking was much, much higher. The rates of biking was much higher. The rates of even taking transit was much higher. It's not surprising. I think, in fact, what is surprising is that we actually found that there were some people walking in the top pattern. Next slide, please. Um, at the time we did this research, we extended it to look at health. Um, and this is how the Washington Post re um, reported our research. So keep going to the end. They said that in this study, we looked at 24 cities built at different times with different street patterns. We examined health data from the um, California Health Survey um, for four years. 
and we control for socioeconomic factors, including commuting times, the presence of fast food, and grocery and other land use. And we found that higher intersection density were significantly linked to reduced rates of obesity, diabetics, and high blood pressure and heart disease. And those are all serious problems. But of course, the press was only interested in one thing. Next slide. So if you roll through it, all they were interested in was this issue of obesity. And these were some of the headlines that I took at the time. And the last one. And the last one was actually particularly puzzling because I don't remember us addressing that issue. Living close to Walt, um, Walmart makes you fat. So these are, but this is really highlighted an important issue that how we build place is not just about how we travel, it's not just about the safety, but it's also about our health. Next slide. So I just wanted to quickly show an example of what building connected street network looks like in my former hometown of Storrs, Connecticut. This is a um, development that was built between 2005 and 2014. It's still being built out. But um, I had the good fortune to work with somewhat with the developers. So let me just show what that looks like. So um, this shows the, the level of connectivity. I live just to the south, about a mile to the south. I lived just to the south of this place, and I worked just to the north of this place. So about half a mile north was my workplace, half a mile south. So I would walk through it here every day, and I saw the evolution. And I got to understand just how well having a connected street network works, how it changes your perspective on the place you live. Um, and next slide. And one of the things I was able to do was I was able to influence this, um, the developers to actually make more connectivity. Um, when they were planning this place, they had basically one entrance into the um, development and what their computer models showed that the intersection could not handle the projected traffic so i was able to get them um, to roll through the slides please next one i was able to get them to actually add an additional entrance into the property to, to add more connectivity and voila their models showed that the backup on the main street was no longer there. So even the models, so that's the models, but in reality, it also works. And I think it really was very important that we did not end up with a three lane street um, that would have prevented good connections across from the university to this new downtown for Storrs, Connecticut. So next slide, please. So what do we look for in um, a sustainable street? So let's just roll through these. High density of intersection, high connectivity within neighborhoods, good porosity between adjacent neighborhoods. These are some of the things that was um, given in your earlier, in, in the introduction. Good variety in street types. This is something that people 100 years ago really understood that you wanted the residential streets to be quiet streets where people, kids could play in the streets. You didn't want all the streets to have the same weight. And there are different ways of doing that in a connected street network that they knew from in those days that we seem to have lost. So if you go to the best designed connected street networks from the 1880s, in, um, uh, to the 1920s, you can see the little tricks that they use to change which streets were true streets that had lots of traffic and which streets were quieter streets. A uh, uh, fifth point, no restrictions on the type of streets that are connected. So a big street is connected to whatever kind of little street there are. 
All streets should be walkable, crossable, and multi-purpose, and all streets should have building frontage. So you want places that are inviting and walkable for people on bike and um, walking. Um, so the next slide, please. So if we keep that in mind, let's look at these um, three, four areas that we looked at previously. So go to the next slide. We see in downtown Dallas, we have the, the high, I'm sorry, downtown Austin, high um, density of intersections and keep rolling through them. The high connectivity within the neighborhoods, the connections to all the surrounding neighborhoods, Good, good variety in street types, probably not as good as it should be in some places that are more skillfully designed. No restrictions on type of streets. All streets are walkable, almost all streets are walkable, crossable, and all streets have building frontage. That was how it was. You see some degradation in this pattern with the freeways coming in with the bigger roads coming in but that's how it was designed um, initially next um, slide um, and go to the next one and just roll through these points you see this is what they're trying to do in Mueller um, in um, the Mueller airport site some of the same issues um, that they're trying to address the connectivity to surrounding neighborhoods, I think, is not as good as downtown, but it's not bad. And in particular on the south, where there's that big park, there's a lot of pedestrian connectivity. So not all connectivity does not need to be for motor vehicles. And this is what you see here. Um, next slide, please. Um, in this neighborhood, you start to see some breaking down. You might have relatively high density, but you also have some long blocks. Um, the connectivity within each segment is okay, but as you get out of each pod, you see that one pod is not very well connected to the other pod. So you're basically forcing all the traffic onto one streets, and you're asking people that are walking to take circuitous routes. Um, and the other thing about this is that it's not a um, very mixed use place. And then lastly, the, the last place that we can look at. Yes, and this, almost all the rules are thrown away. So it's just each little pod is, is designed separately. So let's go to the last slide. So, um, and I think I'm going to skip this because I think I'm running a little bit long. So let's um, um, go over the, go beyond this. And I just want to say that what we are trying to do with bringing back street network patterns is that we're trying to build more livable places, more lovable places, but also places that are more resilient, that are going to be able to um, last for a long time, to transition from one function to the other, and places that are more sustainable if we are able to walk, bike, use transit, et cetera. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. Let's go to the last slide, please. And this is just my, um, um, my con uh, contact slide. So thank you for your attention. And if I, you have any questions, I, if there is time, I'll be glad to address them. Thank you, Dr. Thank Garrick. That was really interesting to hear about your research and the historical perspective. So I really appreciate that. Um, we are going to move on. So please, if you have questions, please hold them to the end and we'll have uh, time for a panel discussion. Um, so our next speaker is Mary Elliott. Uh, she is planning manager for the planning and, and annexation section of the Development Services Department at the City of Fort, Fort, Fort Worth. Um, that department coordinates the Development Review Committee, so she's got her hands in that pot. Mary has worked with neighborhood groups, elected officials, and the development community to implement subdivision ordinance amendments, including connectivity, access management, collector network planning, multifamily block phase standards, and pedestrian connectivity. So Mary is here to share her experience. Mary? Uh, Mary, we can't hear you. 
Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, there's some overlap with uh, my presentation and some of the previous ones, so I'll make mine a little briefer than um, I think we had talked about. So um, I came to Fort Worth in uh, 2014, and so um, at that time, Fort Worth was already doing a lot of things correctly. So Fort Worth already had uh, block perimeters, block lengths, um, and quite a bit of um, uh, requirements for school siting. Um, so there was there was already a lot um, of items that were um, checked off in terms of um, encouraging connectivity. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, what we found was that there just needed there needs to be ongoing education about connectivity. So what um, what everyone needs to can remind ourselves um, is that there are multiple reasons to to have um, good connectivity and a system of complete streets. Um, the multiple routes and connections um, it reduce traffic volume, it increases route choices, it increases mobility, it reduces emergency response times, um, it creates a reliable infrastructure network by um, introducing uh, redundancy into the network um, and it decreases pedestrian fatalities as well as bicycle um, as mentioned previously. So for Fort Worth, what, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Fort Worth, the areas in the loop uh, within Loop 820 tend to be more of the traditional uh, grid type of um, system. And um, as um, as a doctor uh, mentioned previously, um, those types of networks do tend to have better connectivity. Um, he wasn't saying that you have to do a grid, a strict grid network, but he um, did mention that um, that you want to make sure that you have those multiple connections. So um, it is possible to have curvilinear streets. Um, but uh, the ones that have a lot of cul-de-sacs do tend to have a high um, or low connectivity. So um, going to the next slide. Um, so what we did when we started looking at our ordinance and trying to decide whether we were going to um, or what we were going to do to increase connectivity, we looked at a number of other cities in and outside of, of Texas. Um, um, we looked at Austin, we looked at um, the state of Virginia, had the link to node ratio that we uh, drew from. Um, El Paso had already been in implementing link to node. Um, and we looked at, you know, we also looked at zoning ordinances for base codes. And although those are different tools, um, you know, we found they were helpful in um, enforcing the proposals that we were making to neighborhood groups and um, commissions and, and council. Um, next slide. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the link to node ratio, it is um, you know, an industry standard for measuring connectivity. So um, the links are the, the streets um, and roadways. They can also be alleys and pedestrian ways for Fort Worth, we decided to go uh, with the streets for now. Um, and the, the nodes are the intersections, cul-de-sacs or um, stub outs. So for a non-grid street network, um, 1.4 1, 1 is a very, um, that, that's our minimum requirement. So if you're looking at Brooklyn, the borough of Brooklyn and New York, um, the link to node ratio would be um, in the 2.3 to 2.5 range. So for the grid type networks, you are going to have um, the higher link to node ratio. Um, so that we establish that as our uh, minimum requirement and we get very few waivers to that. We are able to um, to obtain that. Um, minimum standard. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So um, <laughs> um, the engineer who um, worked on this neighborhood um, uh, told me he doesn't like always being the example, but to be honest, it, the, this neighborhood is very consistent with the type of um, neighborhoods that we see on the edge of the city. It's, um, you know, it, it is um, a challenge to get that connectivity um, in the more uh, traditional um, areas where they are following some of the um, the older standards in terms of what the development community thinks that the market will um, support. Um, so there are studies that eliminated cul-de-sacs. Um, we find that if they meet the link to node ratio, they, they don't have a ton of cul-de-sacs, um, but we did not choose to eliminate um, cul-de-sacs, at least at this time. Um, that was a, a non-starter for the, the Builders Association. So when we went and um, looked at how we could improve our ordinances, we did meet with a lot of different groups, including neighborhood groups, uh, the development community, um, commissioners, council members. We met with a lot of different people and um, we talked about, um, you know, what we could do to improve connectivity. So in the process, we were able to get feedback from them and then um, present to them some ideas that um, maybe they hadn't heard before or needed reinforcement. So um, for this particular example, you know, we were concerned because they really only had two points of access and this is over 900 lots um, external access. And so uh, our first was that our subdivision ordinance required a minimum of two points of access, but there were times when that just wasn't um, adequate. So we created an adequate facilities section of our ordinance and what we um, what we find is effective is that if someone is um, not meeting our adequate facility section, we always pair it with another section of our ordinance to be specific about what we are asking. And especially in this um, day and age after House, House Bill 3167, you really do have to be specific. Um, so that adequate facilities has been a very effective way of getting more um, infrastructure, but it also it is only effective if we can actually point to something in our ordinance and be absolutely specific about what the, the ask is. Um, so we also, um, we always had public pedestrian access easements in our ordinance. Um, we um, provided more opportunities for where these could be used. Um, and in this in this case, the um, the developer was willing to work with us to provide some extra links um, to the proposed school site. Um, if you see the green um, lines, that was where they, you know, were willing to work with us to do that. Um, and then when we looked at those external connections, um, we, when I say differentiation among the different street types, what I mean is that um, in terms of moving traffic in and out of the neighborhood in our arterial is going to be able to carry more people um, than a than a local street. So uh, when we were looking at adequate facilities, we we wanted to say it's not really just two points of access. We want to make sure that um, you know that we're able to move in and out of the neighborhood and into adjacent neighborhoods easily. Um, you know, Fort Worth has a lot of uh, railroads, has a lot of uh, gas wells, has a lot of floodplains. So um, in order to, you know, really sell this to the, the development community, we had to make sure that we address that or recognize that there were those types of uh, restrictions in our ordinance. Um, So go ahead and um, go to the next slide. So with our block length requirements, um, we had added a new uh, zoning category called UR Urban Residential. 
and it's primarily found in our urban villages and growth centers. So um, for those of you not familiar with Fort Worth, um, urban villages and growth centers are areas that are encouraged for more density, um, encouraged to have, um, you know, more walkability, more biking, more um, uh, closer proximity to different types of land uses. So um, when we reviewed this, we added UR into the mix and then um, we expanded the, the areas of, of for growth centers and for um, mixed use type um, development. So when we did that, we also included some more opportunities for introducing um, public uh, pedestrian access easements and other ways that we could um, increase walkability and, and biking opportunities. So I do give one example uh, on a later slide. So these were all done through 2016 amendments. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So at the same time that we were looking at connectivity, we also adopted the 2016 Master Thoroughfare Plan. And um, uh, Julia Ryan, um, who's now with Dallas, and Jeremy Williams with the city of Fort Worth um, worked on, on these um, amendments. And, and it was a shift from uh, traditional street classifications to a more of a street type approach. Um, that looked at the relationship between um, land uses and, and thoroughfares. Um, so we, um, even within these um, separate categories, we have multiple street sections. So it, it does give a lot of opportunity for um, looking at, at different options. Um, as part of implementing the MTP, um, the new MTP, um, uh, Julia spearheaded the complete streets training. So we um, did quite a bit of training internally to make sure um, all of the staff understood the, the concepts behind the complete streets approach and, um, and also had to do um, additional education in the development community and, and neighborhoods. So um, if you could go to the next slide. In 2018, um, we also uh, passed the um, access management policy, um, and that was our transportation group in, in TPW. Um, and as part of that, we looked at collector network planning, and <laughs> and, doc, and our good Dr. Warnix had said that you know we don't want to look at streets individually, but. The collector network planning, what, what we were finding is that um, uh, the, the streets that are a little wider that kind of carry the, the traffic out of the neighborhood um, were just not being constructed. And so these are the streets where we spearhead or we, we identify those as, um, you know, for, for additional uh, bike lanes, additional um, on-street parking, additional we look at them for um, providing additional amenities and, and modes of transportation that we might not put on a, a limited local street or a local street. So um, that that was our aim and um, with the collector streets and a lot of the collector streets are the, the streets that are adjacent to um, to school sites. So um, and then as part of that um, collector network planning, we looked at um, criteria where there are discontinuities and how we um, would address that. So um, it, it, we thought there would be a lot of uh, pushback on uh, the collector um, network planning, but it actually um, the first year we had three waivers and we only have, you know, a handful of waivers, you know, every year it's been, you know, there was um, a lot of resistance to implementing that. But then once um, once it was in place, um, we were surprised how much the development community was willing to work with us on that. So um, next slide, please. Um, so with the um, street design standards, we've been trying to tackle at least a, a project a year um, 
you know, it, there was a lot of resistance to doing everything in one year. So we, um, for in 2018, we looked at the multifamily zoning districts and a lot of the changes um, were really more associated with the zoning side. Um, but in terms of the um, subdivision ordinance, um, we did put more um, opportunities for um, public pedestrian access easements and, and walkways. Um, we limited the block face um, and at the same time, concurrently, we updated the zoning ordinance. So um, the important thing is just to make sure that you're using the right tool um, to implement the, the changes that you're wanting to um, introduce to improve connectivity. So in 2000, uh, next slide, in 2019, um, we had the active transportation plan, which is implemented, and we incorporated that by reference into the subdivision ordinance. So uh, prior to that time, we had, um, you know, limited widths for the public pedestrian access easement. So we went from two to, um, seven and um, we also um, implemented a language that talked about um, a requirement to uh, connect to um, lake river or creek trail systems adopted plans wherever they exist which we have quite a few of those and um, this is an example this development is called the left bank development and um, we were able to introduce public trails and public use easements um, that provide an opportunity for a different surface type um, in those connections. Um, portions of most of the trail is concrete. There are areas where um, they have different different surfacing alternatives. So um, that you know that development has actually um, evolved and stuck very close to its um, original plan. Um, the next slide, please. So this is an example of um, where there was a lot of discussion about how the the vehicular and um, pedestrian would meet. So it's a little difficult to see, but there are bollards um, that are located um, between where the special paving is and where you see the cars. And so that area is really um, restricted. It's um, you know, it's a pedestrian plaza and then it leads to the trails adjacent to the river. And um, so it gives some uh, flexibility. They can have um, vehicular access if they need deliveries to the um, mixed uses that are adjacent to that area. But then most of the time it remains a pedestrian plaza. So um, it was something that, um, you know, it, it the developer was very willing to, to sit at the table and work through staff to find some different solutions. And, um, you know, if, if you can bring everyone along for the ride, then that's really the best approach. Um, so just in conclusion, it's a matter of finding the, the right planning tool um, for the, the areas, um, context and scale. Um, I think building consensus is really key. If you implement something and you're not able to get everyone to the table, then, you know, it just makes it very difficult to enforce. You're, you're not going to get 100% consensus, but if you can at least um, get everyone to, to join in the discussion, then that's um, extremely valuable. And, and we've had to take things in, in pieces and kind of, um, you know, focus on different um, aspects as we have implemented more more tools. So uh, that's really uh, all that I have. You want to go ahead and put it on the last slide. And this is my contact information and um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mary. Really great work at the city of Fort Worth. We appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'm going to go on to our final speaker and then again, we'll have a uh, time at the end for questions and a discussion. Um, so our final speaker is Jennifer Pruitt. 
uh, the ICP lead AP, City in UA, with the City of Waxahachie. Uh, she's the Senior Planning Director. She is known for her large project management work on the Viridian Master Plan Development Community in Arlington, and she was also the primary planner on the Chisholm Summer Master Plan Development Community in Burleson. Um, so thank you for joining us, Jennifer. She's going to talk about their experience in the city of Waxahachie. So good morning. And first things first, just want to thank you for having me uh, today to pass on some tools in which we are using in Wachahatchee um, regarding our safe routes to school. So thank you for having me. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, we have quite a few tools that we use um, quite often here, and I will run through those um, specifically. But the one thing that I wanted to touch on between, you know, our planning department as well as our public works department, I mean, we work closely together, and I have to uh, send a shout out to our public works. Um, they do some heavy lifting, and so I'll talk about that in our, in our um, sidewalk uh, program. Um, so we have one sidewalk program, and it's all about connecting the dots, and I'll touch on that. Um, we also have a grant program that is relatively new that is um, quite successful. I'll touch on the tools related to our subdivision ordinance. Um, we talked a lot today about cul-de-sacs and connectivity, and I have a few examples of that um, where we maybe have dropped the ball and can do better, so I'd like to note that. And lastly, I'll touch on just some of the tools that we have um, in GIS. So next slide, please. So here in Watsahatchee, we have a sidewalk program. And I think it's important to note that as municipal governments, what we need to do is we need to commit. And I know sometimes that can be difficult to do, but this sidewalk program is one of those in which the city has committed to making those connections happen and have also allowed allotted for the funds for that to happen. Um, and in this instance, there were over 5,000 linear feet of sidewalks installed um, and also eliminated some ADA barriers um, at the cost of a little bit over $220,000. Uh, next slide, please. And we have um, the program in place in which we document before and after. Um, and so this particular slide identifies some roads, primarily Brown as well as Harbin, in which um, there were not any um, sidewalks. And also there were those barriers that I touched on previously. Uh, next slide, please. And here are some after, um, you know, pictures that identify where those connections and connectivity were able to be added to these areas um, in which they were non-existent. And, you know, again, we kind of talked earlier about we need to have those connections so that people can utilize these areas properly. And so this is an example of that. Um, next slide, please. The other aspect I wanted to touch on as well is um, three projects uh, over the last um, recent years that had some connectivity um, that was lacking in sidewalks and they're all associated with schools. So the first one is Wildman Academy and the area um, in which the um, red sidewalks is identified, those are areas where the sidewalks were not in place. And so in 2021, um, this is one of the projects in which the sidewalks were extended um, so that, you know, the residents and the um, students could be able to utilize those areas more properly. But, you know, again, an example recently of the sidewalk program um, where the dots needed to be connected and it was um, installed and completed in 2021. Next slide, please. This particular project um, was completed in 2019. Again, another example here in Watsahatchee where Northside Elementary 
um, has some areas in its close proximity in which the sidewalk was um, non-existent or in poor condition. So in 2019, this is an example in which um, the city um, installed sidewalks um, to connect the dots and make the routes more safer for our students. Next slide, please. And the last example that I have um, related to um, some recent um, sidewalk programs um, was in, in 2020. Again, this is Finley Junior High School in which there you know, was missing sidewalks for connectivity and it um, was completed in 2020. Again, you know, shout out to our public works folks for identifying the need for um, this particular um, area to um, have the sidewalks and be connected. Next slide, please. So I wanna to touch on GIS a little bit because we're very fortunate um, here in Watsahatchee that um, we have our GIS um, division is incorporated into our planning team, which is great. And so we're able um, to have these tools at our fingertips that identify where these sidewalks are located in our city and also um, where the schools are located and what those um, walking distance and times are. Um, the three schools that I touched on, Wildman, Northside, and Finley, are identified on, on this particular slide, but it also goes into the detail of showing these sidewalks, also those walking distances, so that we can, um, you know, make those gaps, close those gaps that we need to. So, again, our GIS folks do a great job providing that information for us. Next slide, please. And when I touch on GIS a little bit, um, with the sidewalk programs that um, Watsahatchee has in place, there's also a component that is available online to the residents and the users of these sidewalks to provide immediate feedback, which I think is very helpful. It allows us to, to um, collect the data um, needed and the feedback um, immediately regarding those areas, and that is also was folded into the programs is to make sure that we can get feedback immediately regarding the projects that we have chosen to select. Next slide, please. Um, the second tool that I want to touch on briefly is relatively a new, a new um, tool that we use a new program here in Watsahatchee, and it is a sidewalk grant program. And basically, it's a 50-50 program. Um, and it's available to um, our uh, property owners. Um, they'll provide a application to us online and it's a public private partnership. And what I mean by that is the city has allocated funds on an annual basis that allows for these property owners to submit an application. The city will inspect the property. The city will also document the project um, before and after. Um, we'll also calculate the cost associated with the project. And what I think is, is another benefit to this particular project is that, um, you know, it with this particular project, what I think is, you know, one of the benefits to the project, it is it allows us to clearly see the um, improvements they're all taken care of at one time through one vetted contractor. So there's no delay in these projects being completed. Next slide, please. And so I have a few before and after. I, I don't think there's probably much to say regarding the before. Um, these are the conditions that the, the um, projects were. Um, and as you can see, after um, installed at the same time, by the same contractor and no delay, um, and the residents were able to reap the benefits immediately. Next slide, please. So I think what's important to note that is a lot of cities are probably struggling with this with the same aspects regarding growth. And so it's important to note here in Watsahatchee, we're probably around 43,000 
in population, but we are scheduled to continue to grow. Um, next slide, please. And with our continuation to grow um, as we, we continue, next slide, it's important to kind of look at the big picture. Um, we are seeing um, requests at um, great speed um, here in Watsahatchee regarding projects. This is probably, I don't know, 34 projects that have been approved. They're in subdivision phase right now. Um, next slide, please. But I think what's also important to note is there's always those other projects that um, are maybe not under construction at this moment. And those include thousands upon thousands of lots. And how do we address that? This particular slide identifies the schools that are located in Waxahachie. Thus, then it becomes very important for us as professionals to clearly plan out with those larger developments where those school sites will be and also address, you know, how the connectivity is, is going to um, be accomplished. So I, I felt the need to say that just because in many instances, what you see on the ground is not what is coming in the future regarding projects. Next slide, please. So one of the items I wanted to touch on or I've been asked to touch on is the, you know, some of the tools that we have in our subdivision ordinance. And I think we've touched on them a little bit already today regarding reducing the block length and also, you know, as far as cul-de-sacs and um, making sure that we have the proper sidewalks that we need in place. And so I have a few examples. They're most recent examples um, that um, in some instances we can do better. And in some instances, I think they were successes. So next slide, please. So this is probably the one that we talk about the most here in the, in the um, department um, related to when we talk about cul-de-sacs is, you know, some of the submittals that we receive initially, they are heavy on, you know, the use of cul-de-sacs. And as staff, I think we're obligated to talk about connectivity and continue to harp on that because we know that that will help us create better cities and places for people to live. But I felt a need to show you this because this is what in many instances are being presented to staff. Next slide, please. This particular uh, example is a, a project that we're, we're working through, but I, the reason I wanted to touch on it today is because we had a lot of conversation with this particular project to make sure that we um, have streets that are stubbed out for future extension um, for a development. And also, I think earlier in this presentation, you know, I've heard about education and, you know, we all learn from each other, but also we have a responsibility to educate others regarding these areas in which we get pushback from developers to make sure that these streets are stubbed out. Next slide, please. And this is the reason why that pre previous slide becomes so important because the reality of it is that particular development is being processed concurrently with a development that is, you know, directly adjacent. So how do we make sure that when we take a look at these particular developments that we, we allow for the connectivity and the coordination to take place? So this particular example, you have approximately a thousand residential lots proposed in two developments. And we were very vocal to require that the developers coordinate so that we can have the connectivity that is needed. Um, the area that I circled in purple, I think we kind of missed the boat a little bit there. We could have asked for a little more connectivity. and. Another aspect that I just have to point out is um, I also identified some areas on this particular slide that um, TxDOT plays a role in um, this particular project, in these projects. So, you know, once you take into account multiple developers, city agencies, sometimes county agencies, as well as TxDOT, things can get a little complicated, but I think we're obligated to make sure that we 
um, have those tough conversations regarding the coordination. Next slide, please. And this particular slide, you know, again, it's also a recent project we're working through, but, you know, talking about those connectivities early on when the specifics of the development are not quite there. However, we know that we want to have those sidewalks of eight feet or wider on some perimeters. And this is an example of one where they're not quite there with how they're going to develop the project. But one of the items that's been, you know, at the forefront is to make sure that that eight foot wide um, perimeter connectivity to some other trails and um, modes that can be utilized for the residents is acknowledged. So I think this at least is one of those aspects of that. And one more item that I just wanted to kind of touch on for you is you know, development definitely is much different than it was um, in the early 90s when I when I started in planning. But I think we've made some improvements and I think we can do better. But from a city standpoint, there are some items I just want to leave with you today. Um, one of which I think that can help us all in what we do on a daily basis and which we're so passionate about is to be patient. Um, we, we, we talked earlier about um, there are tools out there that have been used for decades upon decades that work. Um, I think education is key. We need to learn from each other. There are cities and processes out there that have been successful and we can learn from those. And I also think from a city, we need to be consistent and committed um, to the processes that we have in place. Here in Watsahatchee, we're like everyone else. Um, we're in the process of updating our comp plan, updating our thoroughfare plan. In the near future, we'll be updating our zoning code and, and subdivision ordinance. So, you know, these are all constant changes that we use, um, but we're um, just like other cities in that aspect. And I think lastly, what becomes important for us is in many instances, there's a creative solution out there. Um, and, you know, for us to be open minded to that feedback from the users and hopefully um, utilize some of those creative solutions. Next slide, please. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. That was great. Um, we really appreciate your work in Safe Rest of School and Connectivity and Rex Hatchy. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your tools and experiences. Um, we have a few minutes remaining for panel discussion. So we are going to move on to that segment. Um, uh, I want to start this out by asking Aaron uh, if we have anything in the chat, any questions that we need to address or any hands raised currently that we need to call on. So we have a couple of questions. Um, the first one came after Norman's presentation, which was, how can we retrofit existing suburban roadways to support these principles, which I think um, any of our three presenters could speak to if they were feeling up to it. Would anyone like to take that one? Yeah, I think it's really difficult to retrofit um, what has been built, uh, uh, not just from a um, physical point of view, but more from a um, political point of view. I mean, how are you going to get in there and tell somebody that you're going to put in new connections once they're living with a, 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 um, a set of facts on the ground? I think what is being done in, in can I can I get some help with the name of that town? Watch. Uh, what you had to is really what we need to be looking to is how do you um, um, before the fact makes make those decisions so that you can then have the, the, the connection built into um, the, the planning going forward. Um, but one other thing, though, is that in some cases, m what you might need is um, pedestrian connections, and that might be somewhat somewhat easier to do than um, a um, vehicle connection. I, I agree with that. Um, 
it is always a challenge when you have um, an existing subdivision. What we find is that we'll, um, and we, we do require stub outs as well. If there's unplatted property adjacent to a proposal, then they are required to provide a stub out. Um, and where we find there's a challenge is if we have um, a request for a mixed use zoning category, and mixed use of course has um, very short block lengths, then um, you know what we've requested is that they provide more pedestrian access and um, and there have been times where that has been stubbed to an adjacent property and um, and we have received pushback on that and um, but it's something that you know we're going to continue to make the ask because if if, it, if the stub out's not there then there's no opportunity for future expansion so um, uh, th that's why we kind of focus those types of um, proposals in our urban growth centers and our um, urban villages because um, those are areas where there's an understanding standing that um, more density is coming. So there's a little more buy in into, um, you know, looking at adding streets or, you know, um, extending pedestrian access easements. And and I agree with Mary on that. I mean, we also struggle with pushback here in Waxahachie as well. And, you know, again, we just need to be patient and diligent regarding requiring um, these particular requirements because the reality of it is the, the developments, uh, they're gonna continue to come. We are getting a lot of inquiries about mixed use as well and we will continue to try to use the tools that we have. Um, but I do agree with you on that. We do get some pushback with um, some of the requirements that we are placing on the developments. Great. Um, so we had another question and this came during Jennifer's presentation. Um, what is your utilization of the sidewalks that you're putting in after implementation? So the utilization of the sidewalks in um, our sidewalk program. Can you read? Can you read the question again for me, please? Yeah, sure. Um, the question. I I believe that's what they're going to. Brian, if you want to unmute your mic and explain a little more what you were looking for, um, that's totally fine. But the question was, what is your utilization of sidewalks after implementation? Oh, okay. So part of the issue for us is, you know, we talked about it a little bit during the presentation today is, you know, we want to encourage those routes to be used. But the feedback that we get from um, residents in some instances is there is um, gaps in the route. And when there are gaps in the route where there's no sidewalk, um, that has a negative, you know, um, a, a negative uh, attitude to use the route. So what our hope is, is to fill in those gaps. Um, and we are seeing um, a lot of positive feedback once those areas are, the sidewalks are installed. Um, the students are using the sidewalks, the residents are utilizing those areas. So it is working, but we're encouraging the use of the connectivity. Great. Um, one Thank final you. question in the chat. Do we have time, Sean, or? Yeah, I we? think so. Okay, so I'll paraphrase because this is a little bit of a longer question. Um, have we considered other options besides concrete for our public walkways because concrete is a little bit harder on our bodies and we should be looking to use things that um, don't inflict pain and injuries. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I'm willing to address that. Um, uh, so we uh, do you have alternative services. However, um, the reason that 
there's a preference for concrete is that um, it, of course is maintenance um, maintenance over time so um, if you're a resident of Austin you know that there's a lot of caliche um, that's all around um, town lake and um, it's wonderful for for jogging and and walking. Um, it's you know less intense on the joints, but it does if you if you are familiar with that area, it is extremely maintenance intensive. So um, so it is a trade off. And um, you know we also notice that where we do have the concrete sidewalks, that there um, are usually paths on either side. So we'll make sure that there are. Um, clear areas on either side so that if uh, the runners want to create um, demand paths, then they can they can do that. Um, and um, and that that helps with the, um, those who are frequent runners that have a lot of um, impact on their joints. Thank you, Mary, for addressing that. Um, I think we need to wrap up now, so I'm glad we, we, we were able to get to the questions. Um, just really quick here, just a couple of things for after today's webinar. Um, we're dropping a post event survey into the chat and I really encourage you to take that. We'd really appreciate it if you could do that so we can get your feedback. Um, if you join today and with the intention of getting AICP CM credits, uh, be sure to log those uh, so that you can get those credits. And then we'll also be accessing or, or posting the meeting recording and slides on our website that you see here. Um, and that is all we have today. Thank you everyone for joining us.